Bienvenidos una vez más a este ciclo de entrevistas del Atelier 2020 y en esta oportunidad tengo ni más ni menos el agrado de presentar a Daniele Siragusano. Y ahora vamos a empezar a hablar en inglés para comunicarnos con Daniele. How are you, Daniele? Ah, I'm fine. Hello. How are you? How are things? Greetings from Munich. Yes, thanks a lot for your time. So my yeah. first question for you is Since you are presented as an image engineering expert, what is the difference with color science? But I was very uh, shocked about that because your car, your personal car, is image engineer. Yeah. So, so um, first of all, um, I don't hold any PhD in any uh, uh, color discipline. That's why I don't put color scientists on my card because simply I'm, I don't have an uh, a PhD in that subject. I, I have a, a, a master in uh, okay. a computer science, but not a PhD. But in general, it's it's more like in science when you do really science, you you really want to find out the general mechanisms about nature and about stuff in, in, in our terms about color perception. And on the other side, when you do engineering, you want to find a explicit solution to a certain challenge or a certain application. Um, for example, let's, let's take the very fundamental of color science, which is the CAE um, uh, uh, XYZ system. So this system is, is really designed to to uh, um, to reveal some fundamentals of color perception and, and, and it only basically is, is really focusing on a very simple thing which is trying to predict that two different color stimuli will look the same in a certain very restricted um, con viewing condition let's, let's say a two degree split and and we call this predicting metamers and this is what the XYZ system tries to achieve but not more than that. So in, in science, we are happy with the findings, say like we can describe, this is the experiment and we can describe us with a system um, what's happening. But we cannot really, in engineering, we cannot really generalize from that easily to complex stimuli. Um, uh, so we cannot say just because the, we measure two, the same two X, Y, Z values, then the images will look the same because the experiment was very specific. So in engineering, on the other side, you take the scientific findings as a basis, and then you you really start to engineer towards um, yeah the specific use case you have. And also important in our use case is that um, in in our industry, it's about science, but also about technology, and then very importantly, the art. And this uh, field of tension is where we are actually working and what I find very fascinating because at the end of the day, the colorist is using technology and science to create art. And, and, and that is, is really the difference between science and what, yeah, what is called or on my card, engineering. Okay, in, in the context of an, of an image, modifies the perception of the its color, no? The context modifies the perception. Yes. So equilibration is not enough to keep the appearance of colors, no? So mm -hmm. how you can compensate for these appearance changes? Yeah, so that, that's a really, really good point. When you, when you put calibration as a starting point, you, You, you can only get very far with calibration if you're absolutely calibrating the whole system. So not only the display, but also the viewing condition and all aspects of the system. If you can completely replicate that, then you can take this, the, the system very far. And this is what, for example, what we tried in cinema to, to really say like, we are literally in the same system. But um, in, in nowadays uh, uh, um, uh, 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 consumption of, of, of media, we have vastly changing um, uh, uh, viewing conditions. And we have a bright surround when we watch uh, our streaming on a, on a, let's say, on a handheld device. And then uh, the, we're not dimming always our, our curtain when we look television. So we have all sorts of um, yeah, changing things. And, and this is where we need more than just simple calibration. 
Um, and also what we need to accept is that we have differences in human, and that's really important when we do content creation to re reflect the fact that the director and the DP and the colorist might um, have slightly different uh, perception because we have individuals. And also the underlying uh, basis of calibration are again the XYZ system, which is only designed for very simple stimulus. So this all brings us to the point when we talk about a holistic image processing um, and we have a specific goal um, that um, uh, people like the Academy or Ari or Red or we at, at Filmlight, we are really trying to finesse that thing. And but this is a very, uh, um, it's very hard to make this objectively. It's very hard to measure the quality of, of a color management workflow really objectively. And because you, everyone is using different set of images and um, when you create those, you're always looking at the same set of images. So there's a highly subjective component into this. And that's why I think it's also okay to have different uh, workflows. You have the RE uh, proposed workflow, you have the RED proposed workflow. So you could ask if this is all science, why isn't there just one right solution? But in fact, it's, it's so that every, uh, every color management workflow is tuned to a slightly different set of humans, which are doing this, a slightly different set of images they look in. And that's why it's, it's, it's also important to be able to customize your workflow and to adapt to different workflows for this your very interesting, interesting because a big part of a camera look comes from the manufacturer tone mapping, not not yep. just the sensor, but also the tone mapping. So uh, not from the log encoding. The log encoding is just to save some some codes values to to save uh, the, the the file smaller or something like that so you and you enable the choice for colorists that now are free to select an assorted way to select different tone mappings what is the idea behind that yeah so as you said the un uh, the ungraded image so if you just load the image into a image processing pipeline um, is mainly influenced by what we call a display rendering transform. And this is more on the outside, uh, on the output of the system and not on the input. So it's not really that much dependent on the camera um, as, as long as the cameras are um, a good calibrated to a certain degree. I mean, there are challenges with camera calibrations which, which are on a different topic, but the main difference really comes from display rendering transform. And every big manufacturer has its own display rendering transform. Ari ships with one, uh, 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 Red, uh, also Sony, and then the Academy does a display rendering transform, and we as well. And and also what what in, in most display rendering transforms or output transforms, what's also in there is um, what we call a preferred color reproduction. That means it's not only there to um, to make the image look like it was on set, but also to do artistic tweaks so that skin looks nicer, the clouds in the in the in the uh, 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 in the sky look 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 nice. So there is some creative again. It's technology, science, and art. And in all of the DRTs that are available, there is this this look also built in. What we did as um, um, at Filmlight is really to try to separate it, but I, I think um, we can maybe uh, uh, talk about this uh, in, in a little uh, detail. Uh, but I think it becomes clear that because there is so much um, uh, um, art also involved in this output process, you want to be able to customize it. For this one show, I want to use this. For the other show, I want to use this. And it's not about, OK, I'm sh shooting with one camera, and for, for this, I use this creative process, and for the other camera, I use another one, because that makes matching different cameras in the same scene um, very, very difficult. It's, it's the better idea is to basically bring them all together and then apply the same display rendering transform. That's why transparency is really important um, and give the colorist the full visibility and control over the image pipeline. Nice. So you have a starting point that you can select or change because you can select a different tone mapping or to a starting point, and uh, maybe to to use the same starting for, for, 
from different manufacturers because if you work in red, you have a red gamma four, for example, no, in the IPP two. But in Alexa, you have uh, the 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 RE curves. So right now, you you can select, for example, Alexa boot for red. Also, it's a very interesting change of yep. options. But also, you you are speaking about the the general look or maybe a kind of. Uh, digital stock, you can develop that by using tools that work in the look, right? The, uh, the printer film emulations or the preferred color reproduction are, are in a separate separate step. Right now, you, you have a yeah. lot of different emulations inside uh, your development. And I, I saw that are not just loots, look at the tables. This is important because you can use this kind of emulations, but with HDR or or whatever, you can use this kind of emulations because are not LATs. But can you explain the difference? Yeah, I, I can, and 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 um, maybe I, I talk a little bit more generic about this when um, about the idea because I think we were the, f the first um, that that came up with this idea. So as I discussed earlier, the in in this output transform, there is this uh, this scientific thing to to predict or to produce the same uh, intent on different displays, but also creative tweaks. And when we developed yeah. TCAM, we tried to separate this. So a T, the TCAM display rendering transform is a very, I would say, clean um, output rendering. It does not it does not apply any artistic um, um uh, addition to that um, but we but it's it's with um we, we so the sub, the subject was is, um or the goal was that the starting point when you load the shot into into the the baselight system and use the tcam drt is that what you see on the monitor is what the dp and the uh, and the director saw on set it's almost like a realistic representation but we know that this is not the goal for visual storytelling, is not to replicate the reality. The realism is actually not what, what we need. What we want is an abstraction from reality because you can only get immersed into a, a storytelling a movie if you have a certain abstraction from reality. So this is the, 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 the claim of immersion by abstraction. And I think many manufacturers of technology get this wrong. They think that the more realistic a display or something is, the more immersed you are. But we believe that quite the opposite is true. You need abstraction. And this is what also this, some call it look, some call it uh, yeah, aesthetic feel or, or, or whatsoever. There are different names for it, but conceptually we, you can say, we, we call this a preferred color reproduction. So this is it's really something where you depart from reality. And previously, in, in the past, this was all intermingled in the output process or in the display rendering transform. With TCAM and with our looks, we try to separate this. So we have on the one side a very clean, um, more realistic rendering on the output, but then for the colorist, we add additional uh, modifiers. We call them scene looks, which um, are not limited in, in, in terms of dynamic range and which you can apply for HDR and SDR. And, and this, this additional process allows you to, to shape the look of, of the movie. And you can combine different looks. You can uh, choose, mix, and match between them. And I think this interplay between the, the looks, or we call this preferred color reproduction, and a rather clean output, which does not limit you in the first place. So you can, you can reach a, any color palette you want. But then the thing which really brings the abstraction is the look. So it, it again, it simplifies the technical aspect um, but also maximize the, the creative freedom. This is a very good approach because when you are starting, you need to, to take some reference and later yeah. to, to go away from the reference and start to be creative and to start to create a new world, you know? Exactly. Uh, but, but the problem uh, right now, or maybe two years from now, was the scene refer working spaces? Because a lot of colorists are very uh, usually works in dis uh, display refer working spaces, and the reaction of tools are very different in scene refer. No, so colorists has 
strong resistance with this kind of uh, workflow, but now it's the standard, you know? Now the challenge is to find some control over the several color space transform that we have in model color management. And now is an extra tax for colorists to understand what happened with the, the color management in, in all the work in process. So how you can help with tools about that? Yeah, so, so, so what you're saying is, is really true and this happens, I would say it's a tr long transition over the last 10 years where uh, colorists would, um, would use basically little color management or we call this implicit color management. Um, and nowadays everything is fully color managed. And I think to be fair, when this all started, let's say 10 years ago, the, the, the grading tools and, and the grading systems were not kind of ready. They, they would just take the things they had, the, the grading controls, which, which were there and just apply this in this different domain. And I, I agree that in some situations that wasn't ideal. And, and that's why colorists got this feel that they were limited. And also they didn't really know what, what, what was going on. It was more like in a, a black box. And um, so there are two aspects of it. It is the control and the, again, the, the transparency. And, and for the transparency, for example, we, we introduced the color space journey, which is, which is a, a view in the software, which exactly shows you step by step what is going on with your image, where you are grading, what is the input, where, what is the, at that point in time, the, the, the working space, what is the output, what other transforms are you using? And this brings the colorist, I think, confidence because they can easily debug things, they can, then they can experiment and at any point in time, they know what's going to happen. It's, it's more like a, a very clear view on, on the grading stack. But the, the, the cool thing is um, the grading systems have evolved and we can, now um, take advantage of that. And so the technical aspects of this color management really falls into the background. Once everything is set up, this is where the nowadays, in, in, especially in baseline, where the magic is happening because the color management is fading away and you do not need to bother with it anymore as a colorist, it's, it's, it just works. Yeah. And, and now we can take um, that and, and make tools which take advantage of that because at any point in the grading stack, we know what is the color space. And from there we can convert into other spaces and it's suddenly create tools which, which takes advantage of that. So now you have a base grade and it will feel always the same no matter what your camera is and no matter what your output is, um, looks, boost shadow and all of the new tools we are um, uh, developing are uh, working very elegantly and feel nice because they are hooked natively into this color management. Grading SDR and HDR becomes exactly the same. So it's just, we have more color palette, but the workflow is the same, the tools feel the same. And actually once you, you, you made that step to go fully color managed, actually it, the, the, the technical aspect really fades down and you can concentrate on the picture again. Um, and also we can now um, change the language of the tools and to become less technical. It's not about lift, gamma, gain, red, green, blue. It's, it's about, yeah, you can you can express the user interface in, in perceptual and more natural terms. So in fact, going color managed in the right way actually simplifies the grading process. Yes, yes. Also, I, I, I was watching that you have a little alerts in color journey. So yes. Suppose you, you, you make some strange transformation, the, the tool alert you with the little icons and also you collapse the unusual color spaces for the user. By pressing shift, you can see all the color space again, but you, the, the idea is to, to make a guide for, for the colorist yeah. about color, yeah. color transforms. Also, uh, it, it was very interesting, uh, the, one of the, the conversation with Peter Doyle, I, I, I have here the, the Vimeo channel for from yeah. Film light, you can see here a lot of different interviews with uh, very, very high professional top colorists of the world that speak about the color space as a tool. You know, this is a beautiful concept because it's like to change the angle of of the the concept of the color to change 
color in different dim dim dimensions, for example, not just RGB, but also LAB or maybe a different color encoding. And this changed a lot the behavior of your tools. So the behavior of a control in color correction is related with the operator, no, the mathematical operator, but also with the working space. So I, I see that your development bring three different kinds of operators and all are very smooth to work. Uh, how do you achieve that? Yeah, so it, it, it's, um, it's, the, it's a, um, the, the, the technical implementation of what I've mentioned before is we have the color management now at the core and we have the scene energy on the one side. So we can at any point in time calculate back to the actual scene energy and then we have the display energy on the output, which is something uh, we, we know and we can predict. And in between there, now we have that uh, freedom to create interesting new spaces and new scales of, to use for color manipulation. So we can express tools in stops of energy, like in base grade or in other tools, we are experimenting with new scales like Brilliance or Albedo. And um, yeah, to give the colorist actually more natural um, um, yeah, controls and scales to it and, 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 and also um, divide the, the user interface so how you interface with the algorithm and how the mathematical operations is working so we can divide this um, as well. And taking this even further um, now with the, 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 the spatial tools we have, um, we can bring all of these color tools also in the spatial domain and now create really um, completely different images because we can restrict color, gray, uh, color, color uh, correction on the low spatial frequencies or on the high spatial frequencies. So, so this adds another dimension to the to that creative work. And and and, and working in this uh, multi-dimensional um, yeah, domain is 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 uh, really really fascinating. It's very very interesting to to think because I, I was uh, talking with uh, Walter Volpato, a different colorist that are from Hollywood, a very good colorist that the, the concept of, of the grade sometimes is to, to develop a kind of a digital stock, for example, to emulate the workflow from the old school. You know, you have a stock, the stock has a response and prefer color reproduction, but right now in, in your product, you have uh, the tone mapping, but divided with the prefer color reproduction, so you can control and edit that but also you add some tools that replace the role of the optics, you know, because uh, sometimes the optic make the work uh, about the, um, you know, the detail depends of the optics on any times the MTF, you know, the modulation transfer function, function on maybe the, the, the point spread, spread functions. So I, I was watching in your product, you have, different tools to, to change this kind of uh, behavior of the image. Uh, and maybe the right term is the spatial domain. I, I like to explain a little more what what means spatial domain for new colorists or maybe people that yep. do not think about that. Yeah, and uh, to start with an example, um, probably if you're a colorist, you're very familiar with when you're adding a lot of contrast to an image, you always get this crispening effect. So there's always an interaction between the, the color domain and the spatial domain. And that, that um, because the spatial domain is actually what, what are my values for every pixel in relation to my neighboring pixel. And if you the even- example, if you, Here I have a uh, high frequencies, right? And yes. maybe this is a medium frequencies, and maybe here in out of focus, I have low frequencies. See? This is the kind of the split that you need to, to make mentally. Yes. So, so the, um, the, the idea is to, um, to decompose the image in, into the frequency domain and then allow the, the colorist to do any color grading on different frequency parts of, of the image. So instead of Instead of thinking of an image as a 
two-dimensional array of pixels, which is a really output-referred way of thinking about an image, you know, only because the camera has a sensor in a two-dimensional sensor and the display has a two-dimensional sensor. It doesn't mean that the scene is like that. The scene is a three-dimensional thing, right, which interacts with light and and you, you cannot really do in, in a real natural scene stuff you can do on a two dim a rasterized image. So decomposing the image into frequencies and working on, on the frequencies is a different approach. And you could even think it's so fundamental different, the same as scene referred and display referred color domain. You could think of a, a two dimensional array of pixels is really an output referred thinking of what you are looking at. Whereas if you decompose it in frequencies, it's just another way of thinking about your data at the end of the day. And it, 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 it comes that, that um, with film, as a, a lot of people always re referring to film, and I think that's a, it's a good thing, but really you need to understand what, what you are referring to when you say, I, I want film halation, or what, what are you actually asking for? You're, you're asking for a domain, we call this a domain crosstalk between the color domain and the spatial domain. So if you make something very bright, it starts to glow. This is a natural experience we have in our eyes, um, we have with optics. This is this is a maybe a more fundamental property. But if we have a digital rasterized image and I make this peak very bright, this is a very alien or artificial mo modification. So you want something that behaves natural. So if you make it bright, it starts to glow. That is, that is what we prefer because um, and with those new approaches to to color grading, we 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 can we can uh, bring this to the digital pipeline. So we yes, I, I can recommend some video for the people that are watching right now. To, yeah, you put to, it in the link somewhere left or right or yeah. Yes, uh, also also maybe here you can see some some tools in action that are maybe more clear to, to understand what what we are speaking about. This is Andy Minute. Is a co-worker of you yep. and makes uh, beautiful demos about uh, these kind of topics. So maybe later you can watch the, the this kind of uh, big explanations about that. Yeah. So we so, have hours of, hours of material explaining this in detail. Yeah. But it's, it's worth yes, checking it course. out. Yeah. Or this is just an introduction for people that didn't yep. know yet the, the tools. Mm -hmm. uh, I like also that you have new controls uh, that brings some terms from the CIA, for example, brilliance. Brilliance is a beautiful concept about color in relation with the material. And this is a very good uh, approach because when you boost boost saturation, for example, some some skin tones or maybe some dresses start to glowing. This is the feeling that you have. And you have new controls to prevent this kind of reaction, right? Yeah, we have, uh, yeah, this is uh, something we, we are working on and uh, which will come into in, in the next um, major release of, of uh, Baselight um, is that we can predict when, when this is happening. So we have uh, an estimator for when an, a color um, in relation to diffuse white will start to glow, um, because typically this is what when then when you push color grading too far and you say like oh it looks artificial and typically this is um, one one of many reasons but one of the reasons is that you are pushing colors where they are physically not achievable. I also made a long uh, explanation about this in, in another video, but may, you cannot produce a very saturated color on surfaces, which is at the same time um, very bright. Um, so the, the, the more selective an object is, the less light it um, reflects and therefore the darker it gets. So there is a relation between the spectral distribution of objects um, or, or the reflectance of, of, of objects and uh, the, 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 the correlated luminance and the, the purity or the how selective spectral is. This is very watchable in HDR, especially, because you have this kind of behavior in HDR a lot of times. So yeah. it's very important to, to start to introduce this kind of concept because some colorists that maybe are working for first time in HDR don't understand these kind of topics. It's, it's very important right now to start to yeah, it's a, 
it's a subtle um, it's a subtle but uh, visible uh, thing in um, in SDR, but it becomes very apparent in HDR where you have more color palette in color, color palette in the highlights, at least for HDR for television. Uh, yes. And and suddenly you you can create those colors much easier and um, yeah and that's why we need tools to to uh, predict this and to uh, yeah uh, compensate for that. Yes, uh, uh, maybe some final questions. Um, I see that you have a, a huge ecosystem that make enable to to open your product the full product inside. A nuke or Avid, but not just a plugin. The idea is not to, to use base lights as a plugin, but is to bring the color tools for editing and VFX applications to open the ecosystem and maybe to, to achieve a full compatible workflow with the color session. This is the, the, the final idea. Uh, how does this ecosystem works? Yeah, as we have discussed, um, the, the, um, when we when you talk more and more about image processing, it becomes obvious that you the colorist produces adds um, um, uh, enhancements to the image which cannot re represent it in a CDL or in a lookup table because yes, a lookup table is a per pixel. It's a big limitation, yes. It, it's a it's a per pixel application of a of a color. Yeah, look up how the how the names it says, and and it's a, a very static in nature. That's that's the one thing. All of these nice features we have discussed about, uh, you know, like uh, simulating a natural response of or di dividing the image in into frequency domain and then doing different stuff in different domains. That all doesn't uh, translate with a lookup table. But if this is a vital part of the pipeline, then you are stuck again with oh, you can only have this in the grading bay, which is which is not ideal. That's the one side. So you need more than a lot in a CDL in VFX and in editing to really convey the whole grading stack in a more broader sense. This is one side, and then the other side we see that with CDL and with lookup tables, um, it's very cumbersome to to set up a pipeline because these CDL numbers they don't mean anything. You need to know about the color management environment. So you need to know what is the working space I should apply the CDLs in, what is the display rendering transform I need to use, and all of that. Um, you need to supply this as well. And with the lookup tables, you need to know what is the input space of the lookup table. What is the I, I know that. And then you need to f in, uh, apply it in the right order. And if not, then it's like, and the idea about our um, um, interchange is that we have a, a file format called BLG, Baselight Link Grades. And it has the full grading stack with all of the color management and the input color space to that and the output color space so that everything is documented on the one side but also it's not static. You can change the input color space. Let's say the color is graded on a log C image, but the visual effects artist is working on a ACES linear plate of that or a different plate. So you need to adapt the input color space of that. And, and so you can do this directly in the, when you apply the BLG, you can say, so my input is not longer log C, but it's ACES linear or whatsoever. And the system will adapt on the input side. And also on the output side, you can say, oh, I'm not on a P3 projector, I'm on an sRGB display, and the system will uh, convert there. For this, obviously, you need the full baselight engine running in the host, and this is what we've done with Flame and Nuke and, and Avid. We brought the whole baselight renderer into the different applications as, as plugins, so we are able to apply um, a bit identical um, the, uh, yeah, the, the gradient yes. stack. You, you are including in the VLC, VLC is an extension or or you have a file, a different file to port the VLC? And the, the BLG the, is, is the metadata which we store in an OpenEXR file format. So we're using an image as a container for the metadata. This is, has a lot of uh, um, uh, benefits because we can also place a thumbnail of or a poster yes. frame of the before and after, the ungraded and the graded so that it's not only an XML file with cryptic numbers, but it's actually something you can open up in, in on a Mac or a Windows or a Linux browser, and it, there is a picture you can see. So it's a yes. visual thing. And also, we are filling the standard metadata, EXR metadata, also with information. So the BLG also has the camera metadata, like the shot name and the and the the time code and all and all of that and all the LDS metadata, everything which 
we got from from the file. So you so cannot that, lose nothing because you have the color space, the the, the shot inside, the the color transformations, and you also the track tracker mask, for example, not just color corrections and the no, special yeah. tools. It, it, exactly, it is. It it has the time code of the original clip and based on that also the keyframe animations and tracking data and, and everything really to reconstruct the grade yeah it's yes it's a, uh, what about if you work with a, a ixr maybe you can read for example a multi layer compositing in i i, I mean no you can read all the layers inside the X, exr in in baseline no, I don't know if you have more tools about that to, to, to work with this kind of open compositing. Yeah, so OpenXR is, is kind of the de facto standard in post-production and visual effects for many years now. And um, it has a lot of great features. I mean, it's it's open, open source, and it's very flexible and adaptable. It comes with different compression rates or uncompressed, or it has it ha has many great uh, features. And we want to use a utilize as much as we can for the grading and finishing purpose. So already now we can read multi-part, multi-path EXRs with different layers and different channels and different views if you want to do stereo or or, or, or other things. So we, 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 we can use this and it's very easy in Baselight to select different match channels for your grading based on the EXR because we see this is used a lot and it makes a lot of sense. But we are also um, working on um, additional information you can store in, in the EXR, like the, the camera matrix position, the XYZ world position passes, the normal passes, and we, we're building tools to also utilize this in Baselight to do XYZ base keying, so you can key with a with a volume in your scene, or even can do things like relighting in the grade. Slice uh, the three D volume. Yeah. So I think you can slice. Yeah, you can you can you can key a slice or you can add new light sources. And the uh, the overall idea is that we, um, that we want a multi-path exchange between gr grading and compositing. The same way there is a multi-path exchange between 3D rendering and compositing because because it just proves useful if the if you get more information to the compositing stage, the compositing can accomplish more work. And it and, and requires less re-rendering of um, of the CG, and this takes a lot of time, and that's why you want to pass a lot of um, stuff into compositing. But the more and stuff you pass from visual effects to the finishing stage, the more you can accomplish in the finishing, and also this helps to to reduce the iterations between visual effects and finishing. So it's at the end of the day, it helps in the workflow as well. And it's great fun. Yes, also for animation because animation uh, needs a lot of multipass to, to to finish the final photography in, in maybe in a color session. Very very yeah. flexible. So my final question is about the, the study or to to start with color. For example, what are the recommended sources to study about color? What do you recommend? Yeah, so um, so there are a lot of good um, and basic. Um, if you want, so so it really depends. If you want to get like fundamental accumulation of information, then I would really suggest you go and, and read the primary books about um, uh, uh, applied color science. You don't need to go all the way to uh, visual neuroscience, but there there are very good books in. Um, about applied color science, and this is really this, this should be really the source for fundamental information. Um, there isn't the, the, the internet is and and, and, the, the, and, and and the information about the craftsmanship of color grading. It's a little bit, I, I would say, it, there are also a lot of sources, especially in the internet, which are not really that helpful in, in nowadays modern workflow because a lot of things have have changed and. And a lot of things you can still find on the internet is based on very, um, I would say, legacy type of workflows. But there are also some some good ones here. And the problem really is like that really excellent colorists. They are all all time busy with actually grading jobs. So getting really advice, real world advice in in very elaborated form is a little bit tricky because their yeah, colorists are very busy. 
But what I suggest is I will I will put together a, a curated list of, of books and also good internet resources nice. which you can which you can then link maybe under under the video or somewhere. Yes, and I can help you with that as well. So, but in general, uh, you know, when we was start to talking, you mentioned that color correction is a mixture of art and some from science about perception and also technology. So I, I like to, to speak a little about that. Yeah. It's 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 not it's it's not my my invention. This is there is a famous book uh, um, from Ron Brinkman um, yeah, about compo I about that. compositing, right? This is where where I, I really I, yeah the the art and yeah. science of of compositing. It's a really good book. Should rec should put this on the list <laughs> where we are yeah. on good book. Of course, um, uh, Ron makes the shake interface, right? The shake. I, I think uh, he was involved in that project, but I I never met him in person, so I don't know. Okay, okay. Yes, th this is my first book to, to start to open my mind about the, the relation with maths, mathemat mathematics, and image. Because in, in, the, in a computer, you have just numbers, you know, <laughs> pixels are a sequence of numbers. And it's incredible for me because I, my background is uh, fine arts. No. So I, I, it, it was hard for me to change. The, my chip, you know, my mind about to, to understand mathematics like tools for color grade, you know. So if you try to understand something about the technology, the, the, the maybe the table uh, uh, of art uh, opens a lot because uh, you you are not very aware about the the tool. The tool is not the Maybe the the most important thing, but the understanding about the tools, yes, is really important. So sometimes you 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 don't find the right tool, but you can construct tools by using little blocks. I I I, I see in best light you can make this kind of work to to construct more or less your look by using different tools, but you need a little to, to understand what is the target of uh, each tool, because you have, for example, different uh, different tracks balls inside base, like uh, video grade, film grade, and base grade. So you need to order more or less the, the operations. And I, I, I was watching a lot of video that you have uh, with Andy Minute to explain more or less, to, to, to try to transmit some methods. And this is uh, maybe the uh, one, one more uh, advantage that film light, film light brings usually. A lot of videos that help you to, to understand how you can uh, start with a grade and experience from different colorists in, in videos that are equally important. Uh, than the product. No? For me, it's, it's, it's very useful because I was learning a lot with your videos and different conference that you show, for example, some concept that I never uh, study before. For example, prefer color reproduction. Maybe it's the, the first time that I, I hear that was in one of your videos. And because of that, I recommend again to to try to, to, to see all the videos that uh, Daniele and Andy sharing on, uh, on other people from, from Finlight, sharing in, in, the, in the web page of, of the product. So thanks so much, Daniele, about this uh, uh, introduction for people that maybe you don't know the baselight in deep, or maybe you. And it's a pleasure for me to to speak a, a little when you release the new versions because it's a very good uh, promise. This kind of new tools about perceptual color spaces. And thanks so yeah, much. Yeah, it was a pleasure. Thanks for the for the interview, and I hope this helps um, to get a little bit of a feeling about uh, that because it's a very 
uh, a difficult subject, but we can break it down and uh, make it digestible. So thanks, and uh, what you're doing is uh, helping a lot, especially for the Spanish-speaking community. So thank you uh, as well for, for doing this and promoting okay. promoting the, the science and the technology behind that. Thank you. Bueno, gracias, gente. Eh, esto está subtitulado, así que eh, nos vemos en la próxima entrevista que hacemos desde el atelier. Bueno, muchas gracias. Chao, Daniel. Chao, chao.